So let me, ju let me just start with this brief description now. And you all saw the commissioner's office, so you probably know this about the office. It's the only office in the United States with an agency structure that doesn't have a commission associated with it. It has a single commissioner, the commissioner of political practices, and that individual then is the head of the agency and also makes the decisions that come out of the office. Um, and there, therein sets the tenor for the office. Um, it has been around since 1974. It's in its current, currently its ninth commissioner. Um, I was the eighth. Um, and the tenor of the office is going to largely depend on the person that's there. And that means that at times in the past, the office has not functioned very well. That's the way it works when you have um, one person. Although there's a safety net under that person in the staff, and then there's another attorney from the Attorney General's office that's on contract that helps, that still doesn't, um, that still doesn't add enough to the office that you can't say the office isn't primarily dependent on the person who is the commissioner. That's the way it works. But here's what you need to understand and take away from this. Despite the ups and downs in the office, um, when there's been a true crisis, the office has been able to respond. Um, and the biggest crisis it had, of course, was when there was a, um, literally a, uh, um, a shadow campaign organization that was working within the Republican Party in Montana for the 2008, 2010, 2012 election cycles and actually electing candidates and had a substantial role in the reason why more moderate Republicans were being replaced with extremely conservative Republicans. That was probably the biggest crisis. The office was able to respond. Those of you that saw Dark Money know that the office was able to respond. And that tells you that the structure of the office is the right structure because when, it, when it's absolutely needed, it can respond. But that isn't the way it functions most of the time. Most of the time it functions at a lower level. Um, just to give you an idea, um, in 2009, um, there, were, there were 17 decisions made in the campaign finance area where, where it was a published decision was actually made. In 10, there was eight. In 11, when all of this activity was going on, there was 32. In 12, there was 30, but they really weren't decisions, those 32 and 30. Many of them were dismissals, one page. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that. And then in 13, my first year, there were 37. In 14, 86, 15, 23, and in, um, and in 16, 55. There were more decisions in those four years than in the entire history of the office up to that point. So the office may not always function, but it will always work in the way I'm going to describe it to you, um, which will lead to what Mark said, what do you do? If you go, and we're, we're small enough that you can look, how many have ever gone to the Commissioner of Political Practices website? How many of you looked at that? Okay. If you put in the Commissioner of Political Practices, you're going to get a, um, that's what you're gonna see. You're gonna see a website that looks like that. Now it changes, every commissioner is gonna change. It's the first thing they do is they go in and they monkey with the website. But it isn't just the commissioner, Stapleton monkeyed with the website when he became Secretary of State. Every Everybody who's got an office with an interface with the public is going to change this first thing. But here's what won't change. At some point on this, because it's transparent, um, you're going to get to where you can see all of the past activity um, off the website. Um, the difference between this and, let's say, a district court is that 
um, you, you can get the entire history of this office in one look because here are all of the campaign decisions right here. You can see here's the, th the years of campaign decisions by the current commissioner and then decisions by past commissioners. You can click on that and you can literally have access to every decision made by every commissioner in the history of the office. So it is a compact place where you can explore and look at what the law and what, it, and when I say law, um, these decisions are deliberately written in plain English and they're vetted. So you should be able to read and, and actually understand what it is, more so in some years than others. And how do you find what you want? There's an arrow up in the corner. It says search Montana, but you go to the little icon on it and you don't do search Montana. You click on it and you, you get COPP. Now you're only under COPP. So when you put something in the search box, let's say you do, you do um, coordination, which was a, a big issue in the campaign practice area. If you put that in and click on it, it is going to search for all of the information at the COPP, and here it comes up. Registration by coordination, um, land use resources, although this looks like it went the whole state of Montana, and sometimes it does that, and you have to go back up to the top and do it again. Yeah, it's got public transportation, so it didn't do search Montana with just the COPP. It's not even, not even letting me back in to just get it with the, with the COPP. Um, but you can play with that button and you can literally have access to all of the decisions that, that deal with that issue. Now, how does then, um, how do you interface with, with this system? Well, so the commissioner's office is, is um, once the commissioner's appointed, cannot be removed um, by the governor, by any other administrative agency. Um, you're limited to a six-year term. In my case, it was four years because you probably know all the politics on that, but there, there had been three commissioners appointed before me. None of them, two of them were not confirmed by the Senate, one of them resigned. So I was the, four, the, the fourth commissioner in that six-year cycle. And when I was appointed and eventually confirmed, I had four years that I could serve out. So that was, that was the four-year term that I had. But during that four-year term, who are you accountable to? There's only one group of people you're accountable to. You're accountable to the people of Montana. Because you can't, you think about it, you cannot be accountable to and reporting to anybody else because they're all political office holders. And any one day, somebody could walk in, file a complaint against the governor, the secretary of state. And in fact, they did that while I was commissioner. So you can't, at the same time, you're supposed to be, in, you're, you're supposed to be impartial toward them. You can't be accountable to them. Um, they can't be your boss. Um, likewise, the legislature can't be your boss, although they sure tried to be. <laughs> um, during, during the time I was there. But so that system then has responsibility on behalf of the people of Montana for lobbying, ethics, and campaign finance. And they cover all three of those areas. And even though none of you have used this too much, on that website, you have access to every single candidate in the state of Montana and every campaign finance report that they filed showing every single, per, every single person who contributed to that campaign. You have access to every ballot issue in the state of Montana. Um, uh, and the campaign finance system actually 
works very well in capturing that information, electronically displaying it and making it available to you. It doesn't work worth a darn in regard to lobbying. Um, the lobbying expenses are reported minimally. Um, it's a fraction of what we actually spend in lobbying. And ethics has been a, uh, um, a weak spot of the state forever. Um, there's minimal ethics enforcement. But campaign finance, that system actually works pretty good. So you can access that information and you can compare what is reported and disclosed to what you see. And therein lies what Mark wanted to talk about, which is complaints. Um, what, what is, I mean, if you truly want to engage in this, um, there's more information in this system than you're going to get with any other system you can possibly get involved in. You can, if you're interested in a water right, you can go into the DNRC and with a little digging you can find every water right in the state. And you can see all the information on water rights. There's other systems that have a lot of information on it. But there is no system that so comprehensively deals with everything as you have here with campaign finance. Um, it is cumbersome. You can spend some time playing with it. But you can literally find every candidate, every ballot issue, every political committee. You can find out how much money they're contributing. You can find when it came in. And if you have any questions about whether or not it was properly and timely reported, you can also go to the decisions that might have dealt with that issue. And by using that search function, you can find out, um, find out what's there. Um, has has the system worked? Have citizens availed themselves of it? Um, I think like everything else that goes on in life, if it's working well, um, there's probably not a lot of citizen activity that occurs. If there's a major issue with it, like in 2013, um, yeah, citizens are truly involved. They're filing a lot of complaints. There, um, do you remember when that Stanford flyer came out in the Supreme Court race? It was put out by Stanford University, mailed into three le legislative districts. Um, that was when I was commissioner, and every single person working in the commissioner's office was on the phone for the next two days because there were that many Montanans who were so upset about that flyer <coughs> put out by a university, but. It was a political document. Um, and I don't know why, but in that era, people were, were totally tuned into the politics, probably because the politics was, was not doing very well in Montana at that time. But, but we had um, a lot of people that were involved, and I'm sure that time is going to come again. Um, and that particular uh, document spawned three or four complaints, but the primary one was by Linda McCullough, the Secretary of State, who filed the next day. Um, and we had a campaign finance decision, and we eventually found against Stanford University and Dartmouth, the two universities that sponsored the professors. And um, they ended up settled, sending an apology to everybody who got it, and then they paid a fine to boot. Um, but that, that isn't as important as I think the standard that it set. There was a professor from, uh, from Carroll who got involved in it and wrote extensively on it within the educational journals. So it, it, it has an educational effect far beyond what the, what the individual um, complaint might be. Um, then, if you are thinking about filing a complaint, first of all, um, you need to understand this. It's the simplest complaint procedure that you have, um, at least under the in current interpretation. And I say that at the same time, in late 2012, early 2013, when the commissioner's office legislature left town in 2011, and um, when they left town, 
they didn't approve the commissioner who the governor had appointed. Um, and so that commissioner was out the door immediately. The governor then appointed another commissioner who got into a, a pretty good dispute with the staff and he eventually resigned. A third commissioner was appointed. He stayed on through the 2013 legislature and again wasn't confirmed. And two days after the legislature was over, Governor Bullock um, started a process for appointment and I eventually became commissioner through that appointment process. But in that time period when all those commissioners were changing, there was very little leadership in the office. And during that time period, the office rejected complaints. People would file a complaint, they'd find a reason to reject it, and they'd send it back. The person would file again, they'd find another reason. So even though you've got 30 and 32 complaints dealt with, um, there were only really about 20, because that many of them were just multiple complaints coming. So it's possible that that could happen again, where, um, where when you file a complaint, they'll tell you that it, it has to comply to a certain form. But if you read what the commissioner's office has done, and again, go in there and type it, you'll see that it says right now, the current policy is it, citizens should be able to file that complaint. And as long as they have their signature notarized on the bottom of it, if a person who's experienced in the area, that is the person who accepts the complaint in the commissioner's office, can look at that, even though you've used the wrong word, um, you've in, you haven't stated it in a, in a technical way, if they can see it and interpret it, they have to accept the complaint. There hasn't been a complaint that's been filed that's been rejected now in over three years. So if you want to do a complaint and you think something's wrong, do it. Just file it with the commissioner's office. What happens after you file it? Well, the commissioner's office has seven staff people. And under the current policy, when a complaint is filed, it goes immediately to the commissioner. The commissioner, within five days, must accept or reject the complaint. If the commissioner accepts the complaint, it gets a number. And the number is the year in which it's filed and the lineup of complaints filed. So in 2019, there's only been six complaints filed. Whoever files the next one's 2019 CFP, Commissioner of Political Practices, dash 007. That's your complaint number. And now the person who does the accepting or rejecting is the commissioner. That when the complaint comes in, whether it's by mail or whether it's hand delivered, it'll immediately go to the commissioner. It is the commissioner's first priority because he's got five days to accept or reject that thing. Once he accepts it, and he's going to accept it, um, unless there's just something totally wrong with it. It then is taken by the commissioner and there's another person in the office who's the investigator. The complaint goes to the investigator and what the commissioner is going to say to the investigator is just this. Um, look, here's what the complaint says. Here's the general area of law that we're looking at. Um, it's more difficult for a commissioner when the commissioner is not an attorney. Unfortunately, the, commissioner, the commissioners generally aren't attorneys. Um, there, there was one other attorney before me. He was that very short-lived commissioner in that th series of three commissioners who were appointed and not confirmed. Um, I was the first attorney commissioner who was appointed, confirmed by the Senate, and managed to hang on in there for a number of years. Um, but the current commissioner isn't an attorney, but he's had quite a bit of experience. So he's going to say, here's where the general area of law is. You need to find the facts. Here's the facts I want you to look at. Um, sometimes the facts, you don't need any more facts. The complaint is so clear, you get the Stanford flyer. What do you need to know about a flyer that puts one candidate with a picture on one side and another on the other side and obviously favors the one candidate over another candidate. I mean, that, that is a lot of information in one document that triggers all sorts of concerns. But you still need to know how much money did you spend on it? Um, when did you mail it? How did you mail it? 
So, you know, the investigator, and at the time I was there, we had uh, an ex-Anaconda policeman um, who was also a paralegal, um, and she was amazing. Uh, she was probably the best investigator the office has ever had. And like on that one, she was on the phone and on internet and just had, she nailed that thing. She knew where the mailing house was, she knew how it got there, she knew how much it cost. Um, the whole history of how that document was produced. And each step along the way, we were able to say whether or not they considered the political consequences of what they were doing, whether or not they reported, and they never reported, they never registered, they never did anything with the, with the office. So um, the number of issues we were able to discover. The, but So for your purposes, you need to know the commissioner takes the complaint, hands it to the investigator, the investigator investigates the facts, provides a memo to the commissioner on the facts, finding the fact. Those finding the facts then go to the commissioner who takes the facts and looks to see whether or not there, are, there is law that is implicated and if so, whether or not there is law that is violated. So um, that's the way the decisions are written. Um, and how, how fast are they? Um, if you're in the last of a campaign cycle um, and you're, you're running for office um, in 2020 and it's October, you can expect the commissioner's office will probably turn that decision around in two days, three days, because the, the voters are gonna wanna see that information and the campaign is coming up really quick and it's only fair that the decision come out. That's if the office is working well. Do they always do that? No. There was a considerable period of time in 10 when they were confused by these first incursions in and they sat on those complaints and they actually piled up all the way through the next election cycle. So when I first got there and was dealing with it in 13, I was dealing with complaints that were all the way back to the 2010 election cycle. But that's not the way it is now. The office is current. There's a few complaints filed, and so you can expect that your complaint is going to be dealt with promptly if it's at the end of the election cycle and in a more leisurely way if it's filed now in an off election year. And um, the, the pressure is not on the commissioner that, qu that, that quick to, um, to reach that quick a decision. Um, and what are the ramifications to you if you file a complaint? Um, the only time I've ever seen anybody get in trouble for a complaint is me with one that I issued and that's the one that Mark, that was when you, right near the end of the of Bullock's last campaign in 16, a legislator from Missoula filed an ethics complaint, which at the time was held to be confidential. And he filed it within three weeks of the election cycle. Um, and there was an allegation in it which was just absolutely false. It said that the governor went to a, uh, a horse race in Lexington, Kentucky, and that he, had, uh, he took a female with him that he was having a relationship with. And um, there just weren't any facts to support that, so I wrote back and they withdrew that, but they still wanted to release the darn thing to the, to the, to the press, but at that time there was a statute that said all ethics complaints are confidential. Um, the person filing them, the person who's the subject of it and the commissioner have to hold all those ethics complaints in confidence, and there's a reason for that. Campaign finance complaints should never be confidential because somebody chose to run for office. And when you choose to run for office, you're putting your, um, your history out there. It's, your, it's fair game. And so debate and, and response is, if that had been a, in a, in a, as a campaign finance complaint, it would have gone out right away, regardless of the spurious nature of it. But this was an ethics complaint. And ethics complaints are not the same. They're individual, they're filed against um, they can be filed against any state employee, they can be filed against anybody and they're individual in nature. So the legislator eventually released the darn thing 
because he wanted some coverage on it, and um, and I chastised him for that, and that's the subject of the lawsuit that Mark, and it's it's still ongoing now. It's the only one. I think I got sued 18 times during the time I was commissioner, and 17 of them are done now. That's the only one that's left. Um, so. Um, Mostly counterclaims, third-party claims, individual claims, like in the Whitty trial. There were counterclaims and individual claims and a conspiracy claim filed um, in that, and then they were eventually all dismissed. And, and so if you bring a complaint, like in, a, in the cam a campaign finance complaint, say against somebody who's running for the legislature, uh, and they're putting out materials that you don't think are attributed properly or something like that, or they're not reporting their money right. Nothing will happen to you as a result of making that complaint. No. Particularly not in campaign where speech is protected to the greatest degree possible. I think you should feel as secure as you can be, but if you don't have a thick if you don't have thick skin, don't do it. Find somebody else who does because it is politics and you could get pushed back. So find somebody else who doesn't mind doing it. Um, before I became commissioner, I regularly filed complaints. And so you... Could somebody file a, a suit against... Um, if I make a complaint, can somebody file a suit against me for defamation in district court or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Now, whether it has any merit or not is, is another question. But it's possible you could do it. I mean, if it, I, I just gave you the example of, of what I'm involved in. Um, and it, it is something you need to feel pretty strongly about. But if you have any concerns, personal concerns, then take your concern to Mark, to me, somebody else, and say, what do you think of this? And, um, and there will be people willing to talk to you. And if you don't want to file the complaint yourself, um, then find somebody who will do it. And that's generally the way that these complaints are filed. But don't, don't, um, don't, don't, if it's going to cause you to lack sleep or something. Citizenship is extremely important needs to be taken seriously. More people need to do it. But don't make yourself miserable when you're doing it. Um, the most famous citizen we have in the state of Montana is Deborah Bonagoski. If you saw her from, from the uh, Dark Bunny movie. And she just, she just filed that thing just out of the blue. And she caused um, a major reformation of politics in the state of Montana when she did that. Never filed one before didn't know how to do it, but the complaint was good enough to hit all the buttons, and um, it resulted in, in a number of substantial campaign finance decisions against a number of sitting legislators. So never underestimate what one person can do, because it can be significant. So that's filing a complaint. Um, now, um, if you do get one filed against you, what should you do if you're running for office? And that doesn't sound like this crowd. So how would you get one running against you? Well, I, I mean, filed against you. If you're a candidate, um, they would file it against you because you didn't register as a candidate within five days of the date that you, that you took money or that you declared your candidacy. So there's times that when a person engages in the political process, there's a time requirement that you tell the public that you're engaged. Um, and that means that you did what you did and what you did and what Mark did, which is you file as a candidate with the commissioner's office, which is easy to do, and that you then, after you file, you file your financial reports on the timelines. Um, is that something that candidates universally do well? Absolutely, the bulk of them do it well, but there's always a group of 10 to 20 that have a extreme difficulty with it. Um, and the commissioner's office is on the phone with them trying to get them to file. Um, that's what their compliance staff do. 
to uh, yeah. So COPP has a rule book? Game player? A what now? Do you have a book? Well, got, yeah, they've got books, they've got forms on the website, the website that I showed you. Okay. Yeah. So if I was going to run, mm -hmm. I should go there first. They would be they so, would they would be so glad to help you. Oh, okay. Yeah, they would be glad to help you in person, they'd be glad to help you over the phone. Um, they see that as their job. And there are more specialists in that area, they're, they're called compliance specialists, there's three of them, whose sole job it is to assist people who want to run or to talk to somebody who's got a concern about somebody who's running. Oh, okay. Okay. So if somebody files a complaint against you, um, the, the, the way they're going to do it is if you're a candidate that you're running, if you are a party to a political, have, are any of you involved in ballot issues? Okay, Mark is. Okay. So committees form in ballot issues, and those committees report the, um, the money coming in and the money that they expend um, in favor or against the ballot issue. And that's the other way that you could get a complaint filed. Um, and my advice, if a complaint is filed against you, what do you do? Um, commissioners differ. I as commissioner did not like to talk to the people who filed the complaint um, or the person who the complaint was filed against. Now you have to talk to them at certain formal times um, and that's when I would talk to them but I didn't like it when they came in and, and just dropped in and talked to me. I just wasn't comfortable with that. It felt like it was you know just a little bit. But this commissioner loves it. So <laughs> find, out, find out who the commissioner is, and he would not mind it at all if you dropped in and, and, and talked to him. So every commissioner is going to be different. And uh, so if you get a complaint filed against you and you have the current commissioner, stop in and talk to him about it. And, um, and then respond timely and in full. And if you did make a mistake, just admit you made a mistake. If you think about all of the people that have had, I mean, there's hundreds of decisions that have found infractions on the part of somebody running for office. Do you remember any of them? No. Who do you remember? The one who fought it, tooth and nail, forced a 12-person jury trial, um, caused the state to spend 60,000 bucks on, on the trial itself, and eventually paid a $100,000 fine because of it, and that's our Whittick. That is not the way to, res to respond to a complaint. Um, you, if you've got a, a problem or an issue, try to resolve it. Um, now, then I'm going to add one more wrinkle. Um, there is a whole area of campaign finance that is not used as much as it should be. The, the 19... 12 initiative created something that no other state in the, Montana, um, in, in the nation has, which is an individual citizen's right to explore and pursue um, activities against malfeasors individually. Um, it's a risky business, but that includes this. You're running for, um, for um, whatever office you're running for, and you have an opponent. Under our law, which is unique, you can inspect that opponent's books at any time you want during the campaign with notice. It's used most commonly by ballot issue committees where one ballot committee will inspect the other ballot committees, but you can do that. Likewise, there's individual enforcement provisions that have never been used under our laws. So if you're really serious about um, something that's going wrong, and you don't believe that the state through the commissioner's office is moving quick enough, you should explore what you can do individually to enforce. Um, now, so what would I summarize it with? Would, would um, nuts and bolts of just how, how you deal with, think of the commissioner's office as an extension of the people of Montana. Um, it's a very small office, they've only got six people in there, but nevertheless, they're here 
to keep the campaign finance system as clean and fair, transparent, and, and fully disclosed as it can be. And when they've needed to act, they've been able to act. So they've, they have responded, um, not just the years I was there, but there were years before that where commissioners have responded equally well. They've been able to do that. So th they're an office that you should see as a citizen's asset. Um, and most of you, I think then, where you're gonna get involved is if you see something that you think is wrong, somebody's running for, and this happens, somebody's out there running for office, you get on the website, you put in their name, and they're not even registered as a candidate. Um, or you, they're, they're in your, um, your church or your club, um, and they've got very expensive looking material that they're passing out and you get into the, on, on the website and you go into their name and they're reporting $50 as the total amount of money that they've taken in and spent. And you can tell just by looking at what, you know, that they're spending more than that. And you then file a complaint against them. That's, and you, you don't need to think of it as, I'm against this person. Um, Jane Doe or John Smith, you don't need to think of it as I'm, I'm doing this against them and you're, you're not. It, there's something a lot bigger, which is the system has to run well for all of us. It doesn't matter whether you're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian. Um, if it's gonna be fair, then it has to be reported and disclosed in a timely fashion and that is what you're doing when you're filing that complaint. You're protecting the system. Um, you're not after that one person individually. You're, you're protecting the system that they run on. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful system. Any one of us could run for political office. Um, and we should. <laughs> to be frank, more of us should run. Greg. So Montana has campaign limits for contributions. Right. Are there limits for how much a person can and contribute to his own campaign? No. Because we have some wealthy individuals on there. Yeah, no. That, that's they, been they settled, have to that's been. how much they put in? They, or can they just, you they know, do have their to, wallet and print up their fancy flyers? And yeah, they, they do have to, and that's where, where when you, you see in the campaign that um, a particular candidate has advanced, um, they, they'll either contribute or loan that money to their campaign. They can do either but they will have to report and disclose how much they put into their campaign coffer. And then the reason they have to do that is the campaign has to di disclose how much it's spending. And if it spends all this money, it has to say where it got the money from. Um, but um, the, the kind of complex constitutional system that we operate under has said clearly and emphatically that it is unconstitutional to limit what an individual can spend running for political office from their own money. Um, and so we have, to, we have to operate under that system. So on the current uh, website, I was on there looking at the, um, the uh, individual campaigns for a certain office and I couldn't, uh, I found the electronic uh, people that do it on the, I don't know how they do it now, but through the website, and I could see everything. But then there's people that did it handwritten, submitted their finance reports, and I didn't catch that. I didn't know there was a, you could do it that way as well. So I assumed that these other individuals in this group of people that were running, there was a couple of them that had only filed the reports and that everybody else had not done it. So, and I don't remember how to find it, but it's, the, the actual document is are on there as well. Right now, since 2016, um, the law is that everybody has to file electronically. Oh. The only exception is if you get a waiver, but um, there are there are luddites in in every in every area, and so we still have. Usually, it's it's these wonderful old ranchers who are running who still file handwritten. 
So the way you find that out is um, call the commissioner's office mm -hmm. after you've, and, and just, and, and say to them, okay, I've just been there and I've, I've got a candidate, Jack Smith, and I can't find a registration or a campaign finance report. Can you confirm that that's the case? And they'll get on there right away and they'll tell you if, if that's their job. They actually ask somebody if this is the thing, we're using this thing. Right, <laughs> but always confirm. If you're, if you're, um, if you're gonna file a complaint and you've got a question like that, um, that staff is there to serve you. Um, and, they're, and they're happy to do it. Um, they pride themselves on, on how quickly they're, if you notice, it's when, a, you, you, when you call that office, there's no recording. Well, there's some, sometimes you get a recording, but you, you end up talking to a person very quickly um, because um, there's a good reason for that. They're, they're there to answer that exact type of question from somebody who's, who's um, got an interest in what's happening out there politically. And the quicker they can act, um, the quicker that problem can be solved. And it, then it doesn't become a, the the issue that we were in, in in 8, 10, and 12 was it kept expanding. You know, there were four candidates who defeated moderate Republicans with the shadow campaign that provided more money for their, their campaign than was spent on by either the candidates on their own. And then in 12, it got bigger. I mean, 10, it got bigger, and 12, it got bigger. If, if, we, if it would have been nipped in 8, you could have stopped the 10 and the 12. And right now, um, I don't think there's anything big going on um, other than um, the, the whole use of internet and the advertising that's on the internet. Um, that whole thing is gonna be a real issue for campaign regulators in the future. It is today. Is how do you value that and how do you regulate it? A couple of questions. Um, I guess we should take them one at a time because they're kind of different. Um, the first one is how do you handle something like a uh, what we call a door knocker uh, that gets left on your door handle and you come home from work and you see that somebody has left this brochure. Uh, and it's for or against a particular candidate, but there's no attribution, there's nothing, wasn't printed anywhere in the United States. Uh, what will you do with something that long? I would march, if you're in Helena, I would walk straight into the commissioner's office with that thing and file a complaint. Under the law, they have to deal with attribution instantly. Um, whatever other complaints are there, the commissioner's office has to take an attribution complaint and put that on the head of the line. They have to call that party immediately and say, you've left your attribution out, correct it now. And that's why um, you see um, candidates in the Lewistown area, when I was commissioner, he and his wife scattered out with, they, they had to go print stickers and they literally spent two days traveling that entire county putting those stickers on the bottom of their signs. They didn't want to take the signs down, but they couldn't leave the signs up without an attribution. And they, they worked their tails off. They got it in, they took photos of them all, they sent it back to us, and we released the complaint because the candidate brought it into compliance. Um, so attribution, Mark, is extremely, and I cannot believe that it still happens, but it does every single campaign cycle. You get somebody who, um, now here's an exception to it. Um, and you see this most often in, in, the, um, in the Native American areas on the reservation. You're driving along the highway and here's a big piece of plywood in which somebody spray painted this candidate for public office. That's all they've got on it, there's nothing else. You know what, that's perfectly legal. That is a hand manufactured sign by one individual, it is outside of campaign practice regulation, and it should be. It is, it is the most fundamental and primary form of speech that you can possibly get. The guy made it in his own garage. He, he used, used wood and, and whatever sort of 
spare, you can't regulate that. That's pure speech. Um, so I've got interstate frontage in Whitehall, and I'm thinking about putting up a, a large sign. Uh, homemade? Homemade, yes. Uh -huh. Go uh, for it. No attribution is necessary. But you, if you want to not get a ton of complaints, mm -hmm. just put on the bottom, I made this myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then sign your name because I mean it's, it's funny but that's what I would do if I were doing it um, that's, that's good to know yeah. <laughs> I've got as soon as you start you know you, you've got more spray paint left and more plywood and if you keep going and then you give them to all your neighbors then you're oh no then the no? That, yeah then all of a sudden you've got a political committee two or more people together acting you do this yourself and, and you don't involve any, anybody else. It's just your speech. There are four flags flying in Whitehall. Uh, Trump 2020, and then it says, uh, end the bullshit, or stop the bullshit. So the four different people, so they have to have an, at, uh, an attribution? All those uh, flags? Are, are they commercially made flags? They look commercially made. Then made. that is not an exception to the campaign rule. That is, a, um, that is a campaign expenditure that has to be reported and disclosed, but it's a federal campaign outside of the reach of the commissioner's office. And um, if, but, if, but if that was a state, but if that was a state office, you'd take one of those down, take them into the commissioner's office, and that attribution will be on there within a short period of time. Take them all down? Just take, take one. No, just, just, <laughs> well, you don't want to, do, don't, because then, then they might get you for stealing property. Just take oh. a photo of it and, and get a good description of it and bring it in. If it's a state, if it, if it's a state, state race election. or a local election. Okay. But, um, but there, there are several decisions if you want to, that they, um, Um, you you still you still can spontaneously speak <laughs> without running afoul of, of campaign practice as long. But don't forget, if two or more people speak, um, now you in Mark's example, um, you meet in your friend's garage and three of you make these signs. You've formed a political committee and now you got to report and disclose. So and what it, does the it, um, so if you're going to attribute that, you're going to say the um, Smith Avenue group, you can call yourself the Smith Avenue group, you file as the Smith Avenue group at the commissioner's office, and you report and disclose the cost of the materials. Wow. Does this include something like a voter guide that you are no, making no, give away? Voter guides are not... You, you, in, in Mark's example, maybe I jumped the gun, but I was presuming you're, you were going to say vote for or against. Yeah, for or against. Right. Voters guides don't do that. They just say, here is the race, here are all the candidates, and, um, and please vote. Does there any legal thing have to be done if you make those? No. I'm asking because we're making them. No. I, that's, <laughs> that's wonderful. That's, that's also speech. That, you, do you, you at least have to say who you are on it somewhere? Well, you, you, you probably might want to, but is it something you have to report and disclose? No. Okay. You go as far, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you can go as far as uh, candidate so-and-so takes this position mm -hmm. on this issue, and, can, and the other candidate takes that position yeah, that's on this exactly issue. And I believe you can even go as far as we are pro or against that issue, mm -hmm. but you can't. Pro no? I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I don't think there's been a decision on that, but I wouldn't do that. Okay. I just leave it with the, here's the issues. You know, that's just pure speech up to that point. It's no mm -hmm. different than the guy making, you know, his, his best friend is running for office. And he's out in his barn. He makes three signs and sticks them up. Did you have another question? I don't know. What about some of those uh, committee things like that uh, census thing that came out you know, that looked mm -hmm. like that were from the RNC? Well, and, and that is the problem with the regulation on the federal level versus the regulation on the state level. That, 
it said. It's terrible. It's yeah. it's they, they shouldn't <laughs> be I doing that. Have, I should have, uh, you know, because I think that I don't know if there was reference to the Montana Republican Committee. Yeah, but even then, it's still federal. It's a federal, and it's outside of the reach of the commissioner's office because it's just state. Okay. And Dr. Mott? Um, how about um, advocacy for or against uh, bills that come up in the legislature? Lobbying. Um, that falls under lobbying mm -hmm. issues? Or right. Is, can a citizen on their own? When does a citizen become a lobbyist, I guess, on that? When the citizen spends over twenty seven hundred dollars, there's an ex there's an exception for volunteer activity, which is um, which is under I think it's twenty seven hundred. There's an inflation factor in there, and that should be there. I mean, you you should any citizen should be able to walk into that legislature without having to pre-register as a lobbyist and speak on a bill, and our law allows them to do that can be abused. I mean, you can have people that are getting paid and they're not, they're not disclosing that. And there isn't much enforcement in the lobbying area. Um, that, that needs a tremendous amount of work. And, and if there would have been more time when I was commissioner, I was really interested in working on that. But the campaign practice stuff was so, was so thick that that's what I had to spend my time on. Frank. If someone had a complaint or a possible complaint about a church that was that they said was getting involved in politics by allowing a group to meet in their church at no cost, for example, and that and that group you know endorsed the candidate, uh, who, who I mean it sounds like there would be some kind of uh, question about the legality of. Uh, not counting, not counting the church's space as a contribution to a candidate. Okay. I, 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 how, would that, how would that work out? I mean, okay. just as hypothetical. Right. So, Frank raises a good question. Um, there is one decision on there. If you're going to read one decision, it's Landsgaard, L A N S G A U R D. There's two of them. It's Landsgaard v. Peterson and um, Landsgaard v. 19 legislative candidates. Um, so when the commissioner's office took the Bonagoski complaints and showed that it was willing to look at those group of, of candidates who ran as Republicans but really weren't Republicans, they were libertarians um, who were running under the Republican label because they, the Republican, tr traditional Republicans believe in the rule of law and, um, and um, defend and respect traditional values. And these candidates didn't believe in either of those things, as you could tell from, I mean, they were participating in a shadow campaign, taking money, um, and um, um, they, they didn't comply to the traditional Republican philosophy. They were, they were something different. But as the commissioner's office began to look at them, they filed over 30 complaints with the commissioner's office, which is why those numbers are so huge, on minor points that if the commissioner's office had ruled in their favor, it would have, it would have just hurt everybody. And that Landsgaard complaint was notarized in Art Wittig's office by his legal secretary. And there were 20 some of them filed in one day at the office, all by the same person all notarized by the same party, and clearly they were designed to tie us up. Um, and they were all this. These oil billionaires, the Wilkes brothers out of Texas, and so two brothers and two wives contributed the maximum amount of money to the um, traditional Republican candidates. They each, so they each gave them $160, that's $320 a family, $640 in total, and the complaint was clearly it's bundling, or clearly it is husband and wife together and they form a political committee and they have to register as a political committee and they're over the limit that a political committee can give. Um, 
So there you have it. They're, they're saying you're turning the laws back. And so that decision carefully goes through, dismisses them as frivolous, because what it says is Montana has the lowest contribution limits in the nation, among the lowest, for individual contributors. You have to protect those individual contributors. If you're protecting the Wilkes brothers and the Wilkes family, then you're protecting every Montanan. If you try to limit them, you limit every Montanan. And you can't tell a wife that she can't give $160 and her husband can't give $160. How do you do that? They've each got an individual right to give 160. It's not that much in the first place. And you can't then say, now they're a political committee and you can limit them in that way. So you, you have to carefully look at those decisions and remember what you're trying to do with campaign finance, which is make it, make it, it's unconstitutional to say that the purpose is to make the system fair and balanced for everybody. The Supreme Court has said in, in two seminal cases that that is not a permissible constitutional provision or, 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 or precept. The only thing you're trying to do is to prevent corruption. And that's it. That's the only permissible constitutional consideration. And so what you have to do then in that decision is you say you prevent corruption by allowing everybody to participate in the most equal way you can. Now, 160 bucks is a lot of money for most of us. But if your best friend or your wife or somebody else was running, you'd find that money and it would be within the reach of most of us to do that. That prevents corruption. It keeps the system accessible and available to everybody. And um, the Ninth Circuit bought that argument. They sustained our contribution limits on that. Back to Frank's question, how is that similar to Frank's? Same way. You look at that complaint, which at its core says, well, this is a church, this is a, um, um, a place that has got a tax status that says it isn't supposed to be involved in political activity, but the church isn't involved in political activity. The church is allowing space to be used, and so long as the church is, is transparent and non-judgmental, uh, non-selective on how the space is used, in other words, um, we're in here now, would they let the Trump people come in here? I would suppose they would. I mean, I mean, they should have this, and, as, and if that's the case, then, um, then it's not that the church is providing a community service, it's providing a community space to the community. It's not responsible for the activity which may have a political tint to it, which is solely the responsibility of the group meeting in the space. Um, that keeps the system healthy, promotes activity in the system, and doesn't create this this crazy kind of division that you know you 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 try to prevent by making a real brittle decision. Does that make sense, Frank? So we haven't dealt with that. We went the other way. It was the Canyon Ferry Baptist Church. Um, the that commissioner found that a minister um, speaking from the pulpit on the same day that they had petitions in the back of the church um, against, God, what, which, which one was that? But it was, it was a, a personhood of some sort. I mean, you know, I, I don't know whether it was um, um, same sex or, or uh, which one it was, but it, but it was something along that line and the church was, ah, it wasn't, it was against abortion. They were, they were, um, they were, um, they were passing out petitions in favor of one of the anti-abortion bills that was either the legislature or on the ballot. And the commissioner found that that was enough that they violated their, their, um, uh, their um, charter, went to the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit reversed, Montana paid 275000 I think it was, in attorney fees on losing that one in the end. Um, and I wouldn't, I, I don't think they should have made that decision. Um, it just wasn't enough. 
It wasn't enough activity to rise to the level where you, where you had a, something that you should have said, you sh that you couldn't have said, well, this is not good, but it's still within the limits of what is constitutionally permissible in terms of political speech. But if they're operating under some kind of a, a non-profit category that you could be making a, a complaint against the, to the Department of Revenue? Or you, you could, but you know where that is right now. I mean, I, literally every federal agency that can possibly deal with campaign finance, the IRS, the Federal Election Commission doesn't even have enough members right now to have a quorum. And even when they did have a quorum, they weren't able to make a decision. Um, there is no body that's able to regulate politics effectively on a national level right now. And in most states, there are, there, there's very little effective regulation. We're, we're a rare bird. So did know. I misunderstand you, John? Will you, not every state has an office of CMPP? Every state has a, um, every other state has a commission. Right, and not a commissioner. And I, I just told you the problems with the commissioner. It depends on, the, on, on you know, the ebb and flow of the leadership that's in there. The but, but the commission is worse okay. because you, you can, you inevitably tie them up by just putting opposing views, and they won't act. And, and I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, I was just wondering. Our current commissioner then now is three years more. In, yeah. And then it's a governor's appointed commission right. Right. approved by the legislature. Right. And, and when there's enough of a crisis, there seems to be political will to appoint, to appoint a commissioner. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and now things are, are in pretty good shape. So the, they wanted a more, you know, um, you don't see him in the paper every day, <laughs> and so that's 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 what they wanted. But but he's perfectly willing to talk to people. If you go in and talk to him, he's he's more than willing to engage. So he's effective. He's just doing it differently. Mark, how do um, say we've got some kind of grassroots um, political action committee? They're involved in politics, um, but they're low budget. Uh, what have, do you have? Do you see any typical mistakes that that kind of a, a group makes when they're involved in a campaign or a ballot issue campaign? Um, the best reporters are um, are the citizen groups. The, the most diligent, the most, um, but the one mistake they all make is they tend to overestimate the importance of the money that they report. And because of that, they, they might scrimp in reporting. And I tried to convince everybody I talked to that they shouldn't do that. You should, if, if it's $100 or $50, report the 100 just report the maximum amount that anybody can possibly say you should have reported because n nobody really cares ab about the amount. What they do care about is that you report and disclose and you do it on time. And so um, that's the one issue is, is um, and particularly I face that when I talk to people from out of state when, that are involved in ballot issues and are providing finance, and it, it, it's very difficult to convince them that they need to report everything, particularly if it's in kind. No, you need to go to your staff, and if you've got three staff working on it, report not only the hours that they work, and when you report their hours, include the value of benefits, and give the percent share of your office overhead attributable to that staff person. All the Montana groups do it that way. They know that now. But it's hard to convince the out-of-state ones to do that. And so I suspect there's probably, you know, in particular, well, the, the, um, the gun-related groups in particular, particularly the, the National Rifle Association and their Montana affiliate, 
Um, if you go and look what they're reporting, they're reporting virtually nothing. And that is one, er one area that I never really had time to get to and nobody's gotten to. Is, um, so there, there are a couple of areas where there's activity which is, which is underreported. Um, but it isn't on the groups you all know, in Northern Plains reports. MEIC reports uh, and discloses um, they and and they do a good job of it. Okay. What about little? You know, you've got your three people who are making signs in the garage. Um, what would be their main mistake? Just not reporting at all. Well, they wouldn't. If they're making signs in the garage, if you're doing a sign for a candidate, the candidate has provided all the materials and your labor is free. So all of the value of that is getting reported by the candidate. So you don't have to worry about it. The only time that comes into play is if you're running a rogue operation. Um, that is your, this is just Mark and his two buddies and you're not involved with anybody. You're just making this stuff up all on your own. Then you're gonna have to report your own political committee. And um, John and other men can come ask the oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. You, oh, yeah. Um, my question, I guess, is a little different. It's, so the campaign or the candidate uh, takes in X amount of dollars, and these candidates today are taking in a lot of money. So they spend only like a quarter of it. They get their office, or they don't get their office. They go uh, run for another campaign and have all that money that they didn't spend. Yeah, that's illegal. That's illegal. Yeah, yeah. You you have to close your campaign account, and then you 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 donate that money to the area specified. You can't use it for personal use. What is the one area that candidates needs to be looked at more for candidates? It's the use of campaign funds for personal use. Mm -hmm. That is the one area that other states, particularly like in like in uh, New York and and, uh, but it's outrageous what they do out there. That. Um, that is being prosecuted pretty thoroughly out there where candidates use, they actually run, you know, more or less a scam campaign to get the money and then they use it for their personal use instead of running for political office with it. And that, that hurts everybody because it just, it just hurts us when, when we don't, I mean, there's nothing more pure than candidates running for office us funding them, it's just the way democracy works. And if you read what Baca said about China and why China is going to prevail, Baca, Baca said, you know, for years the Chinese, did you guys read that article? He, he said, that for years the Chinese told me that their system was better than ours. And he said, now I'm becoming concerned that there's some merit to their argument because they say that, okay, they've only got one party, right? And that party, produces the candidate that eventually, but they say that there's so much peer vetting within the party that the candidates chosen are competent. Whereas the American system favors incompetency and ambition. And so we get incompetent candidates with vast ambition because you all don't run and I don't run. I mean, the, the, the candidates, who should run, don't run, and the ones that do run. And so he was saying, I'm concerned that maybe China's got something going there because our candidates are not good. Um, China's are better, <laughs> even though there's, <laughs> I mean, better in a, in a way of competency, not certainly better, the worst of our candidates are still going to be better in human in a humanity sense than the best of the Chinese. But the Chinese may be better for global warming. They may be better for economic growth. They may be better for those other things. Lauren is telling me to be quiet. <laughs> but it, it does make you think a little bit about it. We just got to get more people running. That's the bottom line. Um, uh, do uh, county central committees have to uh, report their donations to candidates? Yeah. 
Yeah, and Is they that do. On the state level, or yeah, you... and and as I praise the citizen groups, I will say that the county central committees are 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 not good in general. Um, not because they're ill-intentioned. It's just because they don't. It's just not part of their culture. So that's where the commissioner's office talks and works with them. But the few complaints that have been filed against county central committees, uh, uh, it's just. They're, 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 they can really get behind and way off kilter. Not huge amounts of money, but still it should be reported and disclosed. Now, if you want to get into some interesting reading, there were a couple complaints filed. Um, one was complaints in the Great Falls Republican Center. Yeah, that's the one of the worst, uh, yeah. And that's, that was, you know, close to a fist fight. What they were doing. The other is, and I think that was a campaign finance, wasn't that a campaign finance one? Yeah. Uh, and then the other one is, um, was filed over in Missoula in the uh, Demo Democratic Central Committee in Missoula County um, for people, I guess, campaigning against one another and then not disclosing what they were doing. So both of those make interesting reading because it's that's us. Well, and, and again, the rules aren't there because of what is happening one person to one person. The rules are there because um, we're only as good as the whole system is good. I mean, and it, that, uh, and does, does uh, advocating against a candidate constitute the same campaign finance violation or issue as supporting the candidate? In other words, um, is there a, is there, isn't there a carve out for um, uh, money coming in that allegedly does not specifically support a candidate but is issue related and um, you know, something to the effect like, you know, um, tell um, tell your state senator this is the way you feel about an issue uh, because he hasn't been voting right. uh, in support of you know uh, oil wells in eastern right. Montana or something like that. So the way we do that in Montana, and we're one of the few states that does it this way, is that was the Disclose Act that passed in 2015. If you place an image of a candidate or a candidate's name in any form of advertising within 60 days of the date of the election, you have to report and disclose the money. It isn't that you're spending money for or against the candidate, but every citizen seeing that ad is going to wonder, are they for or are they against and how much are they spending? So they got to report that group, whatever political committee that is, has to report and disclose that amount to the commissioner's office and you can find it in those filings then. And it doesn't matter whether you use the magic words, vote for or vote against. Um, if all you say is call legislator so-and-so, and that's within 60 days of the date of the election, you have to report and disclose that money. Unless it's, again, falls under the individual exception. If it's just one person. Um, 2,500 calls? Well, one person, one person getting mad about a candidate and putting an ad in the local paper. Just that person, himself or herself, or building a sign, that is not a reportable campaign expenditure or contribution. It's constitutionally outside of it, the same way a candidate is outside of it when he contributes to himself. But ballot measures would fall under same thing with the ballot measure. If you do that individually, you put the bottle bill deposit legislation on, and you're going to see all sorts of individual people running ads against it. And I'm sure they're all coordinated and orchestrated by Coca-Cola or some bottling company, but they don't look that way when you see them. <coughs>
what about the situation where you've got the, uh, a you're running a campaign, you're a candidate, you're you've got a, a rump group in your district uh, that is uh, you know the, the white self-esteem lady sewing circle has gotten together and they're doing everything they can for you but it's totally throwing everything off message and you're losing control of your campaign. <laughs> Is that, can you contact those people and say, no, please shut up, or is that collusion? Oh, you can, you can contact them. Okay. Yeah, there's no way they can claim coordination when you're in an argument with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it, you know, it's... You just can't start manipulating. Right, Co and, and co coordination is the same thing. The, the Bozeman High School, the Bozeman City Council put that high school ballot on and they had a really beautiful logo that they, they had developed. And then the outside citizen group um, ran an independent campaign, but they just took the logo, <laughs> which they could do. Um, they were for the same side as the city w w was, um, but the city didn't, it was, they didn't put a copyright on it and it was, it was public property basically. So there was a complaint filed saying that there was coordination, but the commissioner's office found, no, there's no coordination. It was just a clever use of a public resource by, by a group that operated independent of the city. And it was clever. Can candidates share resources? Can organizations share resources, like on ballot issues? Right, right. But and that was the same thing that we did with candidates. That the candidate who took another candidate's photo from their public website and used it on their campaign ad against him, that was legal. It was not a... That's legal. Yeah, yeah. Because it was, a, it was publicly displayed. So if you wanted all three candidates, three candidates not to share a brochure, um, they could do that and that wouldn't be, as long as it was reported properly, that would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so this stuff is nuanced. I think you can see that. And, but I don't think if you're, if you're worried about what's happening, go back to what you said originally, which is you found a candidate who hadn't filed and and that's possible. I think that was you who raised that issue. Yeah, yeah. Call the commissioner's office, confirm it, file your complaint if you do. If you do that, um, and you know it, it, it does involve speech, um, and it's protected speech. And so, um, one thing you can do with protected speech is you can you can report and disclose it, um, and then. To a degree, you can limit it, and in Montana, we do limit it. You know, you can only give so much to a candidate in Montana, and that is very aggravating to the wealthy, um, and it's constantly challenged. Um, but the guy who had an office in Montana for eight years, Jim Bob, closed his office down last year, so <laughs> he finally he finally gave up on all the lawsuits he was filing. So. I think we got our contribution limits in place for a while. All right, I think any, all right. You've been a great audience in, so, thanks.